And let's see if my voice is. Um, we're in a series called Exposed, the Truth About God. Last week, last week we answered a pretty big question. Um, I'm going to fast forward. How can we trust the Bible? I mean, we're exposing the truth. We're trying to figure out, is this stuff true? Is, is what we believe is the foundation for us as Christians? Like, does this even make sense? Is it real? And last week, we, we answered some pretty tough questions, and I'm not going to go over them again. If you missed it, you've got to go back and watch last week. Because for us who are Christ followers, last week we learned that we can know that we know, that we know that the Scriptures are true, that they're good, that they're real. We answered the question by, by answering it this way. When we look at the Scriptures and even at the New Testament, we, we can validate their, their message. We can validate the truth in the in the testimonies of what we read, the letters that we read. First off, by how soon they were written after Jesus, right? The New Testament was starting to be written only 40 years after Jesus. Eyewitnesses were all over the place. It could have been debunked right away. Uh, we, we said how widely then also the, the first church accepted the Gospels and accepted the letters from Paul as Scripture, as God's Word to them, and then the whole Old Testament as well. We looked at some archaeological stuff and, and time frame. It was ah, so cool, good stuff, um, because we talked about just our, like um, old archives. Like when you're looking at old text, the way to validate it is is by getting how asking the question: How many copies are there, and how how close to the original date those copies can be dated. And we saw that the Bible, um, the original documents, there were over 25,000 copies. And all of them said the same thing. There was no discrepancy. There was no, oh, they messed it up there. That many copies all saying the same thing validated the testimony of what was in the New Testament. The, the crazy things about the Bible, when we looked at archaeological stuff, was that the Bible knows more about our history than we do, right? We talked a little bit about archaeological finds and stuff even over the last few decades. That there were there are people and times and places that we haven't found yet and that have been mentioned in Scripture and then all of a sudden they will dig up whole nations like the Hittites that they didn't know existed but the Bible told us their whole story. See, the Bible knows more about us than we even do. And we're still learning and the Bible is showing us it knows more about us than we do. Then the last thing we talked about was that the, the Bible actually tells the future in ways no human could ever tell. It's called prophecy. And we looked at just two out of hundreds and hundreds of prophecies through the Old Testament and New Testament when it was given thousands of years earlier and then thousands of years later when it was fulfilled, historically fulfilled. Not even just like the Bible fulfilled it, but history looks back and you can study it in your classroom. This is crazy stuff. So I'm starting on the foundation that we know that we know that the Bible's real. It is the Word of God. And actually, this is what it says about itself in 1 Timothy, that all Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed, and He's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That Scripture, all of it, it's God-breathed. It's God's story. It's it's 40 different writers over a 1,500-year period. One story as God is the author. It's amazing. It's amazing. This morning, I'm going to tell you the entire story. You up for it? Yes. All right. Can you p- turn me up just a little bit, Casey? Because my voice is about to go like that. So I don't have to talk as loud. Thank you. So this is what I want you to do. If you've got your notes um, on your worship program, if you notice, they're a little thicker so that you can hold on to a little bit better. Isn't that nice? You're supposed to say yes, because we like intentionally did that so that you can have notes on like thicker paper, right? And, and it's perforated, so you don't have to like lick it and, and then rip it like it's good stuff. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to draw this on your notes, okay? And uh, you're going to see it for a moment. I'm going to come back to it over and over and over again, because this is the whole story of the Bible, beginning to end from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And all I want you to draw is kind of two bookends. And then a line, and we're going to fill in these names. So you don't have to get all the words yet. We'll get, it. we'll get them. But I know some of you, you just love taking notes, and you want to capture this as we go. So the whole story of the Bible starts in the book of Genesis, right? Everybody say Genesis. Genesis. Right? That's the first book of the Bible. The first book of the Bible is all about creation, right? It's creation. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, everything in the earth. He spoke it into existence. Talk about power, right? He, he breathes 
things get created, like fiery balls called the sun, out of God's mouth in words. This is nuts. I could do a whole sermon on that. But, but he creates it. In the beginning, he created everything. But there's some key things in this creation that I want you to understand. Not only did he create the heavens, the earth, the animals, all that stuff, he created mankind. In verse 27 of Genesis 1. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he what? Created them. Male and female, he created them. In the very beginning, God created. And I tell you what, God is a pretty creative creator. When you look at the world, I mean, I love going to zoos because the wild animals can't eat me, right? Like, to see, like, just God's creativity. When you see some of these birds with the colors and the, I'm like, I don't even know that color exists. That's insane. And God is that kind of creator. And actually, we are created in his image. And in us is also that creativity. We are pretty creative beings um, in his image. So in the beginning, when he created us, there were two things that he put into place in that creation. He put Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, and he put them in a garden. It was called the Garden of Eden. And this garden was perfect. Actually, everything was perfect in the beginning. And in this perfect existence, God had a desire for two things, for his relationship with this, this man and woman. He wanted them to relate and to rule. Those were the first two things that he put into place with them. He wanted them, and he created man and woman, not because he just wanted a zoo. He wanted a relationship. He wanted a relationship with them. So that's the first relationship he desired, to relate to God, and he designed them to relate to each other. That's why there were two of them. (laughs) He just didn't create Adam. He said, no, this isn't good for you to be alone. I'm going to create another. That's why we have been wired from the beginning of existence to be in community. God wired us in relationship. So he created him in the garden to relate and to rule. This is the next level. Because God said to them, hey, I've created all this stuff. Now you, you name them. You name the animals. Now when you're given the power to name something, you are given authority over it, to rule over it. Let me give you an example. How many of you have ever had a baby? Just if you ever had a baby. Now once you have a baby, one of the first things you do is name it right that's your privilege that's your right that's as a parent i'm naming you and you're gonna have to live with it whether you like it or not right like that is that is that same thing it's that idea of rule because that child is under my kids my boys are under my rule right they're under my authority god has never been a god of chaos god is a god of of authority and accountability he's always had from the very beginning layers of order and authority he said i want to relate with you i want you to relate with each other and i'm going to give you the rule over creation well things went south pretty quick all right because even though that was his desire perfect perfection the enemy was present his name's satan and in this instant brokenness entered into the story of mankind and, and we've heard this story, and it's not just a story really happened. And the reason I know it really happened is because, like, Jesus goes back and talks about it. Like, if, he was there, all right? And, um, and when we look at this scene, so Adam and Eve, perfect garden. There's one tree they're not allowed to eat from. The serpent shows up and whispers, right, over to Eve, hey, God's, God's hiding something from you. The only reason he doesn't want you to eat this is because he doesn't want you to be like him. He's holding out on you. So if you eat this apple, you're going to be like God. Welcome to the first deception that is still the deception he tries to do in us all the time. He challenges your identity. That's what the enemy does. Oh, you think you belong to God? No, you're not good enough. You'll never make it. Oh, you think think Jesus is real? Oh, no. mm -mm. Like he continually wants us to doubt who we are in Christ, in God. And in this moment... Eve eats the apple and it says her eyes are open she sees now all of good and evil and not only that she stares with Adam and then Adam eats it and boom the world has fallen sin has entered in it's broken things are broken now why in that moment 
they knew they were naked. They knew they weren't right, and they ran and hid from who? Their creator. They hid from God because they didn't want to be near him anymore. That's what sin does. It separates. Brokenness separates. See, this instant when this happened is why today we experience crap. It's why there's cancer in the world. It's why, it's why somebody who actually even could be living a good life experiences very, very hard times and very horrible things. It's why there's divorce. It's why there's self-centered actions. It's, it's, why, it's why there's terrorism. It's why you name the evil. This moment is why. Because this is a broken world we live in. God created perfection and we broke it. We broke it. <clears throat> it's unfortunate, isn't it? Sometimes I get ticked off at Adam and Eve and say, Dadgum you, we could have been in the garden. I mean, that would have been awesome, right? Everything's perfect. Our relationship with God, perfect. Our relationship with each other, all is good. Anybody dream of that? I'm just wondering. Any married folks in that? All right, so like, we dream of those things. God dreams of them too, just so you know. It was his original intent for us. So, creation. Say these with me. Creation and then brokenness enters in. Let's keep going on in the story. <clears throat> Later on in the, in the history, God shows up to a, a guy on the backside of a desert by the name of Abram. And he goes to Abram and eventually changes his name to Abraham. And he makes some promises to him. And these promises actually matter for us today. These are some pretty big promises. So the next word is promise, God's promise. Because of this guy by the name of Abraham, he says these three big things in Genesis chapter 12. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. At this point, he's an old man and has no kids. That seems a little implausible. Like, okay, how's that going to happen? He says, I'm going to make your name great. I mean, everybody's going to know your name, Abraham. And third promise, he says, and all people forever will be blessed through you. Those are pretty big promises, aren't they? So if I ask you the question, and, and I really need a show of hands on this, have any of you ever heard of a guy by the name of Abraham? Just raise your hand. Okay, promise, kept. You go anywhere on this planet and ask anybody in any religion, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Abraham? Yeah, they have. God keeps his promises. You will be a great nation, he said. Well, he ends up having a son in crazy miracle circumstances. And not only just a son, he ends up having 12 sons that then become the leaders in what we now, or what is called then the 12 tribes of Israel. So now there's not just, you know, him. It's like, boom. Now he's got this family and this family keeps growing and multiplying. And before you know it, there's millions of them. There's this great nation by the name of Israel. Anybody ever heard of a nation called Israel? Just wondering, all right, yeah, yeah, they're still around. And God has big plans for Israel, just to be honest with you, when I look at scriptures. Um, and then he says, all will be blessed through your name. I'm going to get there in a minute. Because from the root, from the seed of Abraham, comes the one that changes everything. We'll get there in a moment. So there's promises to Abraham that God kept, but then there's promises for us that we see in the book of Exodus that are actually were for the Israelites, but they're for us as well. God is a God of promise, and then he is a promise keeper. He always keeps his promise. Because later on, hundreds of years later, the, the Israel uh, nation decides to be in e Egypt and slowly becomes the slave nation under Pharaoh in Egypt. Hundreds of years go by, and all they know is that we are the slave nation that lives underneath the Egyptian nation, and Pharaoh tells us what to do, and we have to do it. And God sees it, and he says, this is not my intent. This is not the way it's supposed to be. So he sends and calls out a guy by the name of Big Mo. That's what I call him. Moses, right? And he says, Moses, I need you to go set my people free. I mean, you, you got to go get them, and, and I've got a promise for them. And he gives the nation this promise in this moment when they're being set free from slavery. And these words hold true for us today. He says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. That's a pretty big promise, isn't it? He's like, I'm going to get you out of Egypt. I mean, I'm going to set you free. 
right? I'm going to pull you. I'm going to save you from slavery. Then I'm going to free you. Well, didn't you just free us by getting us out of Egypt? And the reality is no, because even though they left Egypt, Egypt, Egypt was still in them, right? They still had the mindset of slavery. God said, we got to get this out of you. We got to free you from that mindset. And then I'm going to show you with my mighty acts, I'm going to redeem you. Do you know what the word redeem means? It's to bring back to original intent. God's always had an original intent from the very beginning of creation. He says, I'm going to redeem you and I'm going to take you as my peeps. What's up? Like he wants some people. He's like, you're going to be my people. These promises are still being fulfilled today for us. These promises God still does in our life because we are not necessarily slaves in Egypt, but we are slaves in sin. Sin holds us back and, and it creates a block between us and God. It says the only way that we can cross that river, right? That sea, that red sea of sin, <clears throat> is if I save you. And so he sent Jesus and he said, I'm going to go down and save them. Because they can't do good enough. They can't be strong enough. They can't, like, I'm going to do it. And he did it. And he still is saving people today. Then not only that, he frees us from the slavery in sin. Because even though he forgives us of the sin, the sin still does things in our lives, right? We're still not perfect. And so now he says, now I'm going to break that in you. I'm going to free you from those bondages in your life. And that's going to be a journey so that I can redeem you. God had a plan for your life. He had an original intent when he put you on this planet. And yet the brokenness in this world pulls us far from it so many times. He said, I want to redeem you. I want to bring you back to your purpose and then i'm going to adopt you into this thing called the church this is the family of god you get to be his peeps what's up right like that's what this is god is a god of promises and he always keeps his promises amen i mean this is good if you've experienced this you can say amen this is good all right let's keep going let's say these with me creation brokenness, promise, and now law. The law enters in. Because Moses now has this, he's got a few million people on the middle of a desert, and God's like, they don't know me that well, and they don't know what to do, right? And so he sends Moses up to this mountain, and he gets these things called the Ten Commandments. Have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? These commandments he then brings back down to the people, and what is the heartbeat behind this? This is called the law, the law. When we hear the law, we're like, oh, the law, uh, uh, uh. it like keeps us, actually, the law protects you from people robbing you, right? Like the law is good. The law of this land, the law of any land, like the law for God was this. The Ten Commandments were his way to share to his people, hey, this is how I want you to relate with me. Don't have any other gods other than me. Don't worship any other idols. I will be your God. And this is how you relate with each other. Doesn't that sound familiar? God's always been trying to teach us how to relate with him and how to relate with each other. That's what the law is. It's helping us how to do that. How do we live this out? And so when he gave the law to his nation, the Israelites, as they're wandering, the law is good. It actually exposes where we're wrong so that we can make things right. But, the, but there's a bigger problem with the law. Because nobody could ever be perfect, right? And so something else had to enter into the story, and we're going to get to that in a minute. So now the Israelites have the law. They know how they're supposed to relate with God. They know how they're supposed to relate with each other. They've got the list, and God has given it to them. Well, things were going well for, for a good bit. You know, they're like, wow, this is God, whatever. And then, and then they saw something in all these other nations that had kings, like, why don't we have a king? All these other nations that we see have kings. God, we want a king. Give us a king. And God's like, bad idea. But they're like, no, we want a king. And so he's like, fine. And they end up putting a king to rule over Israel. And, uh, and it went sideways. It went south. Because kings that try to rule will rule as their kingdom. And that's what ended up happening. Kings were put in a place that... Yeah, they kind of knew the law. They kind of knew what God wanted, but they would start to do things their way and the way they wanted, and they would rebel. The next word is rebellion. They would rebel against the relationship with God, and they would start sinning in ways opposite to what he told them to do and how to live. And in that rebellion, they were walking away from God. We see all through the Old Testament in relationship with the Jews and the Israelites in this season, this continual cycle of rebellion. Where they'd be like, okay, we're, 
God now has removed his presence from us. Because God and sin, God and rebellion, they don't live in the same camps. And so when they were rebelling, they were walking away from God and his presence and his protection. And so they would put themselves in a season of of oppression, a, a season of hard times because God was no longer with them until finally they they were like, we messed up. And they would turn back to God and say, God, forgive us. And they'd repent and they would fast. And God would say, finally, I want to be your God again. And things would go well for a while. And then sin would enter in and they would start to rebel again. And then they'd say, oh, we messed up. Ah, we're being oppressed and these other nations are coming in and taking over us. And oh, God, and then God would come back. And we see this cycle over and over again. Now, when I look at that history, I can easily say, well, they were stupid right like <laughs> they had God they were with God and God was and he's like you're my peeps you know like all this stuff and they're like but just to be honest with you I would have been right with the crowd why do I know that because I know my own heart is pretty daggum rebellious and I think most of us in the room can say yeah there's serious where I know I'm rebellious we rebel we feel like eh. And maybe you've been in a season like you knew God a long time ago and you just walked away from him. And yet you found yourself in a place where doing life your way hasn't really panned out. And you're like, maybe God has a better way. And he does since day one. He's given us everything we need to relate with each other and relate with him. It's always been his plan. I need to speed up, all right? So they went through rebellion. So here we go. Creation, brokenness, promise, law, Rebellion, and then the story changed. And then the story changed. That's just a passage. If you want to look it up, it's Nehemiah that goes through and talks about the cycle of disobedience and rebellion over and over and over again. Um, Because now entered into the scene, grace. This changes everything. Everything changed in this moment. This is that moment in history that split history in two. Because God said, I don't want this anymore. Like, I see sin, I see brokenness, I see a group of people, I see rebellion, and they're not getting it. I want everyone to have the ability to have a relationship with me. And so he sent Jesus. And when Jesus showed up, grace showed up on the scene in a way like it had never before. Like, never before. Now, I want you to understand the difference between two words, the words mercy and the words grace, okay? Because we get them confused a little bit. When we look at God's story, he gives us both, but they're different. See, mercy, mercy is this. Mercy is when I don't get what I deserve. That's what mercy is. It'd It'd be like this. It'd be like if I just got angry, beat somebody up like to a bloody pulp, and then the cops showed up, and they threw me in the back of the squad, and I... And I got busted for it. And finally, I'm getting to the point where I have to sit in front of a judge. And I, I was wrong. I mean, right? Like, that's just not cool doing what I did. And uh, that didn't happen, by the way. But let's just say it did. And I'm looking up at the judge. And the judge looks down at me. And I'm thinking, okay, I've either I got some jail time coming, definitely some community service. Like, I don't know what his judgment's going to be down me. And he looks down and he says, um, don't worry about it. We're good. And he just sends me out of the room okay that's called mercy it's not getting what you deserve see in our relationship with God he gives us mercy because honestly our sin our brokenness our rebellion all those things in our life actually if they were fully played out in our lives would eternally separate us from God that's just a fact But he says, "Um, I love you. I'm not going to give you what you deserve, which is actually hell, which is actually separation from me forever. I'm going to show you mercy. See, grace is completely different from that because grace is extravagant. I mean, this is crazy. It'd be like me doing, you know, like beating somebody up, getting thrown in, and I'm sitting in front of the judge again, and he's looking at me. And he says, ah, we're just going to wipe this off the record. And I would like to give you a million dollars. Excuse me? Yeah, just use it however you want to. Just do whatever you want. We just, we thought we'd give you a million bucks. You're free to go. See, grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's what grace is. 
Jesus allows us to get what we don't deserve, salvation. That's grace. And now when Jesus showed up, it is opened up for all of us, a free and open gift to anyone who would receive it. This is a good part of the story, y'all. This is why we're here today. Because grace has entered in. Jesus has done his part and paid the price so that we could receive what we don't deserve, our relationship with God forever. Forever. I want you to say this word with me. Grace. Say it one more time. Grace. I want you to let that kind of permeate your heart this week of what we received. So creation, brokenness entered in. God gave his promise as he's still fulfilling them. The law, which helps us relate with God and others. And then, of course, we're rebellious and the nation's rebellious. But God says, let's change it all. The next part of the story. Um, oh, no, I got to read this. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is how God connects it all together. In John chapter 1 in the Gospel of John. Out of his fullness, God's fullness, right? Right? We have all received grace in place of grace already given. Receiving more of the more of what we don't deserve. For the law, which we talked about, given through Moses, right? That was, Moses gave us that. But grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. The law exposes where we're wrong. That's why it exists. The law shows us what we've done wrong. But Christ shows us what we're getting despite what we deserve. Truth and grace through Jesus Christ. Oh, it's good. It's a good part of the story. See, when Jesus then, after he accomplished all that he was to do, he ascended back into heaven. And in that moment, he says, I'm going to send you something greater. Like, because Jesus said, I have to go, so something better's coming. Get ready for it. And he sent, and we read in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit which is a whole new move of God. The Holy Spirit is God himself present in you and me as Christ followers. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is where? In you, whom you have received from God. Jesus entered up and he sent the Holy Spirit. God's full presence in us. He is counseling us. He is exposing sin in our lives. He is teaching us what God's word is for us. The Holy Spirit is connecting us with eternity now. And he has been working ever since. That's pretty awesome that the Holy Spirit is working. <clears throat> we need to let him do his work. See, the, the Holy Spirit in our lives is the reason why, even though there is sin in this world, even though there's brokenness and pain, the Holy Spirit is why in our life we can still experience joy. That, that broken things can be put back together. That redemption of sin, broken relationships and hurts can be, can be put back together and healed and made new again. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He puts us and continually puts us back to God's original intent. It's the story of redemption in our life. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing right now if you are a Christ follower. If you allow him. You can quench him. You can stop listening. And just like the Israelites did with God, you can rebel. But I tell you what, I'd rather be with God than against him. I'd rather him be walking with me. So the Spirit, we get to the end of the story. We get to the end of the book. The book of Revelation talks about Eternity. The last word is eternity. Say it with me. Eternity. It's forever. This is hard for our finite minds to wrap around. Like, we understand time, right? Like, right now I'm looking at a clock that tells me how long I've gone and that I should stop, and I'm not. Like, I know, I understand the clock. I understand time, right? Like, that's how we operate. Every day is scheduled. Click, click, click. Like, we hear it. It's hard for us to really understand forever. Like, no end, but that's what the end will be forever, eternity. And in the end, when we see in the book of Revelation, I'm going to read the last chapter, we see that God puts back what he originally intended at the very beginning, and instead of it being in a garden, he puts it in a city, the new Jerusalem. And in this city, he wants two things to happen. What? He wants us to relate with him and relate with each other, but now back in his original intent of perfection forever. 
forever. Let me just read it so you understand what this is going to look like. Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, this is the city, the new Jerusalem, coming down, um, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, as Christ. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Does this sound familiar to you? This is the same thing he's been saying the whole time. From day one. I want my peeps. I want a relationship. I want them to relate with each other. And I want it to be in perfection. But we're not there yet. Then he says he, (laughs) this is good news for us. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things, it's passed away. He who has seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's the end of the story and the beginning of forever. Back into God's perfection of what he's always intended. There you go. The whole Bible. There's some bits I missed. You need to go back and read it. But I think you hear the key theme to the whole thing, right? That God's promises to save, free, redeem, and have a people have always been his heart. And he's doing it right now as we speak. The word, let me go back to the, to the graphic. The word that describes our story with God is he is rescuing us. He's rescuing us. Some of us in this room have been rescued. We've walked into the promise of salvation and we're being freed from sin in our life. And we're starting to experience the redemption to find our purpose. What has he put me here for? And you're getting connected to, to a body. Because when I look at the, at the story and the timeline of Scripture, of God's story, all this has already happened. Where are we? We're right here. There's only one more thing to happen. I don't know the day or the time. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. It's like, buy my book, I'm going to tell you. But like, I don't know when but I know it's the last thing and it's probably pretty soon and there should be a sense of urgency about us to actually live the way God called us to live in relationship with him and a relationship with each other for those of you who are Christians in the room I'm just going to just be blunt to you if that doesn't wake you up then, then I don't know what will like in your walk with Christ in Hebrews 10, and I talked a little bit about what Hebrews 10 talks about community. And uh, in, in Hebrews 10, it says this. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Capital D, it's that day. It's forever. That all through the New Testament, we see the day, capital D. And the encouragement around it is, be in relationship with each other. Be connected in community. Walk alongside each other. And so I'm going to challenge every single one of you to get plugged in to a small group, to walk beside somebody, to do it, to, to spur each other on, to experience the one another's, to prepare yourself and ourselves and myself, living more and more into God's presence for this day to come. So that's my challenge to you as Christ followers. Now, those of you who don't know Jesus yet, I hope you hear his heart. I mean, I hope you hear his story. He's not against you. He's not looking at you with a magnifying glass trying to burn you like an ant. Like, he is for you. He is pursuing you and he's done everything he he can do to have a relationship with you. But it's your choice to accept the gift of salvation and be saved. Scripture tells us, confess that Jesus is who he said he is, that he died and rose from the grave and that he is your savior. 
and you'll be saved. I'm going to ask us to stay in church together. For us to walk into these promises, wherever you might be, maybe, maybe you're in the middle of being freed and redeemed. I don't know where you're at in these promises. But I'm going to ask the prayer team, anybody who is a part of the prayer team or can pray with somebody to come down front on either side. And if you need to take that step of faith and say, I actually haven't even walked into the first promise God has for me to be saved, to experience the salvation, I want you to respond as we sing in a moment and come up and pray with, with one of these prayer team members. They're not scary and they won't beat you up. They just, they're there for you, all right? They just want to pray over you and pray with you. And maybe you've got some, uh, something else going on in your life. I don't even know what it is, and it has nothing to do with anything I preach. But you just need some encouragement. This is that time and space to get that. I mean, where else do you get that in a week? A time to just hear from God and receive and respond and let him speak. So I would encourage you, take that step and just pray with somebody. And nobody will look at you and be like, oh, look at them. Like, that's not how we are around here, okay? Um, we're about to sing a song that pushes in to these promises that proclaims that God is the God of promises and that he will keep them. And I want us to proclaim it like we believe it, like we know that we know this is who God is in my life. No matter what I'm feeling, no matter what my emotions are doing, no matter like God's truth is true and I'm going to pursue him and his promises. So God, as we sing and as we respond, show us where we need to walk into your promises. If we need freed, if we need saved, if we need to respond, God, give us the courage to respond in your presence. Just meet us now.